Mm. Thomas Scripps. Okay, Why let would me, you go let from... me introduce myself, yeah. maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good. You're, it's the first time here. So, <laughs> okay. tell us yeah, about I'm, I'm Thomas Vau. I recently started as a research software engineer at Alto in Richard's group. And yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about scripts. So, back to you. What was your question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, at what point do... Like, what, what's the point of scripts instead of Jupyter? Why would you break out of Jupyter and do something else? Um, well, there, there are two things for me. Um, one thing is um, that scripts can be used outside of the Jupyter environment. So if you have anything calling um, or that needs to call your scripts, the, any bigger program, then you need to get out of Jupyter. That's the one thing. And the other thing is uh, scripts are more easily controllable uh, from the outside. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like like a common problem, people will say, OK, I have this Jupyter notebook. I need to run it on a GPU. Or I need to run this 100 times. And they want to use our cluster, because that's what the point is. But when it's in the Jupyter notebook, that's really hard. Yeah. And I yes, believe Thomas will walk us through solving how that. to how to modi how to modify that. Yeah, um, the the other reason is that is um, scripts tend to be more flexible. Um, if if you have one Jupyter notebook, uh, you have one workflow. If you want to modify things, uh, either either you modify the notebook. Um, but then you lose your old lose your old things. So if you change parameters, or you have to make a copy, or you have to make a large parameter um, matrix in your notebook uh, from which to select, and even the selection can go wrong at some point, mm -hmm. and you never really know in what order the cells were were executed and so on. So things can go wrong in a lot of ways uh, in a Jupyter notebook which they can't really in a script because a script is executed from top to bottom and mm. there are no, I ex first execute this <laughs> cell and that cell. Uh, and that wrong order of execution can actually lead to very um, bad problems once you, uh, once you have some really nice results and you can't reproduce them because you don't know in which order they were, the cells mm -hmm. were executed. Yeah. So, yeah, That's, I think okay. that along with uh, running it on a cluster uh, where you have to run it multiple times is, I think, the two main reasons mm -hmm. to go away from um, Jupyter scripts and go to actual Python scripts. And going there is not yeah. really difficult. Okay. Should we do the example? Yeah. Well, okay. if, if you have a Jupyter lab open, there. Yeah. Let me get started. There are two options how you can essentially export or how you can, or there are probably a lot more, but we'll <laughs> mention two of them. So um, Thomas, when you start programming like this, do you start in, um, do you start in Jupyter or do you start as a script directly? Personally, um, I'm not really using Jupyter. Uh, I think Jupyter is, um, a good tool to communicate uh, your your scripts, a good tool to present your scripts because um, you can have very ni nicely formatted documentation along with the script in the form of mark markdown cells. So for publications, I think Jupyter scripts are something quite useful if it's just one wor workflow. Mm -hmm. But if you want to um, run a program Mm -hmm. I think they are inconvenient. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm and, the same way. Like I usually will start as scripts and programs directly rather than. Uh, yeah. So in the lesson, where do I start now? Um, um, yeah. Safe. Uh, just in that, that place. Uh, safe uh, as a Python script. Yeah. What's my starting script? Um, in that instance, uh, for, for this you don't, it doesn't really matter what your starting script is. Um, in the exercise, we will provide a starting script. Mm. You can already download that if you want. Okay. A little bit further down. Yeah. And just use that. So what should I demo? Um, let, let's, let's essentially demo the exercise so that. Okay. 
we then give a little bit less time for the people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm so downloading this putting notebook. Putting that as observations notebook. So let's see. I need and to download it. it and save it to your Jupyter. And then I will move it. Probably from yeah, from downloads to wherever your Jupyter lab is located. Or if that is too inconvenient, you can also yeah. just upload it within Jupyter. That's mm, the alternative. Maybe I should demonstrate doing that. Yeah. So let's say I'm running on a different server, not on my same computer. I can go to yep. new. Uh, the upload icon. That's, upload. Yep, exactly. And then and you can then just navigate to. I select it from downloads. Mm. And then it's ah, there in the bottom. There. Yeah, OK. So I select it, and then you can upload it, except I've already moved it. So <laughs> yeah, here it is. Yeah. OK. So you can either right click on that in the, exp oh, uh, oh, no, uh, right. uh, I think here? right click on that also works. Um, Oh, no, it doesn't. No. OK, then file, <laughs> export notebook as. Mm, yeah. And Oops. then executable script. OK. That would then, again, give you a download option, so you would have to copy it again. There yeah. is, an, there is a, in my opinion, more convenient way, because uh, that's a way how it will stay in your Jupyter uh, directory and that is if you go to mm, okay so now i need to save it and do the same thing where i yeah move it to the right place hmm, this is a bit complex so, isn't it yeah the, the other option is if you go to file okay file and open a new terminal a uh, new terminal file new New at uh, the top terminal. terminal. Okay. You can then use the command that's in the in the um, in the lecture slides or in the lecture uh, course material that Jupyter and be convert that converts your script over to a Python script. Okay. And if I list this, I see whether observations.py. Yeah, and there. if you, yeah. OK. And if you go to your Explorer and essentially refresh, then it will also show that file. Oh. Oh, I didn't need to refresh, but yeah. OK. So it refreshes itself, but depending on how fast you are. <laughs> so this is the contents of the file. OK, yeah. so basically what we've just done is we've downloaded a notebook put it in our Jupyter Lab area, and then converted the contents of that notebook into, well, a, a non-notebook plain text file here. Yeah. And now it's available as just the same thing that we would have programmed ourselves. So we could have copied and pasted this from the notebook into here or something like that. Uh, or, yeah, the only problem is or, that if you uh, try to copy from a notebook, um, you're not really getting multiple cells at the same time. Yeah. So if you have it over, over multiple cells, you have to copy each individual cell. Um, now, we can simply mm -hmm. try to run it. Um, if you go back to your terminal that you opened. OK, that's here. Yep. Mm -hmm. You could simply run Python or Python 3, depending on your setup. Uh, Python? I guess. Weather observations. So since I'm in my Anaconda environment, Python is Python 3 here. And if I run this, it shouldn't give any output, but you should get a file. Uh -huh. And OK, and if I list the directory, you should get a weather PNG. Yeah, yeah. OK. OK, 
let's give everyone five minutes to essentially repeat this mm -hmm. so that we are all on the same yeah. page. Uh, does the ls command work in Windows? Um, probably Maybe not. Uh, the alternative would be dir. dir. OK. Yeah, I guess we can wait here to see. Some error with converting the script. Can you paste the error? Yeah, it's sort of surprising how difficult it is to take one notebook and convert it to a... Oh, yeah. Um, on Windows, uh, in, in general, uh, if you download any potentially executable code, uh, Windows will say, oh, this is harmful, this is harmful, I'm not downloading that. Uh, it makes some sense because it doesn't know what the code does. But in this instance, um, it's not harmful. Yeah. Mm. Um. Can we mm, repaste the contents of the file in HackMD so people can paste it directly into a text file? Um, yeah. Give me. Well, will you do that or should yeah, I? Yeah, I can do that. OK. So. And should we demonstrate the other option then? So let's say you can't download it. Here's another option. We open the browser and we make, actually, no, we can go to File, New. I never actually do that, even though it would make sense. I go File, New, New Text File. And then I'll rename it to Weather. Weather observations to dot pi, removing the name dot txt. And click rename. And now I go to HackMD and copy all of the text. And then come back here and control V to paste. And there we go. And now, how do you say file, say Python file? OK. OK. Yeah. Um, so the next thing that is um, very convenient with uh, Python scripts or Python code instead of uh, Jupyter notebooks is that you can create a function, uh, can export functions to a different um, to a different file, so that you can can use them from multiple different. Uh, Notebooks or not multiple different uh, different um, note, yeah, notebooks of or scripts. Okay, and that's what we are going to do next um, because we have a rather short notebook. So the or we had a rather short notebook and rather short script. But even in this, uh, we do some pre-processing and we do some plotting, which are two things that very often. Is very similar for a lot of uh, different for a lot of different tasks. So by essentially um, exporting the pre-processing of the data, you can reuse that for other data for other data sets or very similar data sets. Mm -hmm. So in our case, this is essentially the 
um, selection or, or the conversion of uh, the local time column to a date time uh, format that is under, that is compute, uh, better understandable to the computer and the selection from a start to an end date. Okay, so we're so, splitting. We are splitting yeah. the file into multiple parts. Okay, when would you do this in, uh, in your daily work? Um, <laughs> probably in my daily work, I would rarely do that because I would essentially start with having the uh, the things split it, but this is something. Um, if you have started uh, your, if if you started from a um, Jupyter notebook, and you do some pre-processing things, and then you think, well, I would like to use a second data set that has very similar data pre-processing steps. Mm -hmm. um, I would at that point say, okay, I'll take my pre-processing steps, export them into a Python script that I can load. And then just have that line, but in both in both of the scripts, because I don't have to duplicate the code. So if I did a mistake in my pre-processing, I again only have to fix that mistake once in my, in uh, my pre-processing script. But this isn't just about pre-processing; it's about any code that you want to be usable from multiple other yeah, places, of course. right? Yeah, okay, that, that's uh, for for any code that you repeatedly use actually mm -hmm. so if, if you if you have steps that are really used very often in very many different um per different workflows it definitely makes sense to export that code into a specific function mm -hmm. because if you ever notice any mistake or anything you did there you only have to modify that in one mm -hmm. uh in one file and not in however many projects you have where you use that copy yeah. code. Okay. So to do this, do we make we make another we Python file? A new file. Uh, which is... So I do that from file new again. Yeah. New so text Python file. file. Oh, okay. Mine actually offers Python file. <laughs> ah, interesting. That's, yeah, different Rename. versions. So I rename it to weatherfunctions.py. Let's see. OK, I'm rearranging my tabs. I have weather observations and weather functions. So maybe I'll just copy from here. This is the pre-processing part. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I copy and copy I paste into, into weather functions. Weather yes. functions. Okay, yeah, it wraps, but that's okay. And I will file, say, Python file, and now weather observations. So I should modify this to. Mm. So essentially, um, you remove the weather uh, local time. Okay. And the line below. So this. Yeah, or the two lines below and replace them by calling the weather functions. Okay. Pre-processing. Mm, so I replace that with this. Yeah. But I also need to add this other highlighted line, import yes, weather functions. You need to import the weather functions, otherwise it doesn't know where, whether, where to find that. Okay, and I'll put that here, and I will file save. If I don't save, I guess it's bad because it won't run. Should I try to Probably run it not, again? Yeah. You can, yep. Yeah. Sounds like a good plan. So Python weather observations dot pi. Well, no errors. So should we give five minutes to um, allow everyone I would, I would, to do that? Um, Maybe five. I'd actually, yeah. I'd actually give uh, give people ten minutes okay. uh, because uh, it's also you're also asked to uh, add or export the plotting. 
Mm. So export some more. There is a solution for that. So if you don't okay. manage in those 10 minutes, uh, that's not an issue at all. Yeah. And you okay. can just in the end use that solution, but give it a try yourself. Okay, yeah, so this is good. So this should let everyone catch up. We have 10 minutes. And if you are having difficulties, I'd really recommend ask someone. If you're around with someone, ask them to take a look and um, see together. Okay, see you in 10 minutes. We are back. So, so let's see, we have what? about half an hour left. Um, what should we do now? Should we continue? Yeah. I, and I guess I we can so. emphasize if something is not working right now for you, don't worry too much. So what happens in this lesson won't um, won't affect anything else in the course. This is sort of standalone. So um, if you'd like, you can stop and take this as a demo, for example. And then you'll know what you can try to get to later on whenever it's time to do this. And then, well, if you have your own editor not in Jupyter, this will be easier in some ways. And yeah. OK. Yeah, um, so let's go on. Uh, so up until now, we only reorganized our code a bit and uh, made it more, well, made it be uh, better maintainable, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't really uh, get into uh, how to um, automatically, mod uh, well, pass in additional arguments, pass in arguments um, from other scripts um, or from the command line. And that's what we're going to do now. Why would we parse arguments from the command line? Uh, for example, if you're going to run this on a cluster because uh, it runs for either a long time and you don't want to block your, co your own computer for a long time, or um, you have to run it with multiple different, arg different input arguments and you just want to not, yeah, Again, block your computer because you will run it like 500 times with different uh, with different input arguments. Then um, running it on a cluster is quite useful. And then to get the input arguments in and not have uh, you normally use uh, you normally use input arguments from the command line or from config but files. I I might simplify that to say you can control what the script does without changing the contents of the script. Yes. And then that lets you do all these other things. So yep. you could have one script and then easily run it on a different input file without editing it with different yep. arguments. And that opens up things like running it on the cluster and all these things. And it's yep. basically <laughs> like the universal interface. So Python has it, R has it, C has it, everything. And um, You'll see this in any programming language and anything which becomes non-interactive. Yeah. So in Python, um, for Python, it, uh, Python itself in its standard libraries has a an argument parser that's sysargv, which essentially provides you all the uh, input arguments uh, for the Python call, with mm -hmm. the first argument being your script. So sysargv0 is your script. Mm -hmm. And um, any following arguments are the arguments that are passed into the into uh, or that are additional command line arguments, and that mm -hmm. you can interpret. You can also take the um, uh, the script file that was being called, of course, but commonly you don't need it. So, um, let's should we do an example together? Yeah, we we can essentially just take the weather functions file and okay. modify it so that it, uh, um, not the weather function, sorry, the weather observations file and modify it in a way yeah. that it takes us command line in arguments as input. Okay, so oh. we add import sys here. Yep. 
And, and sys is a module that's built into Python. So it's just like weather functions and it provides other things within Python. Yeah. And now we add what set start and end uh, time? No, we, we, we actually no. modify to uh, three lines again. Uh, here. Yeah, exactly. OK. So we I set will... those to not use uh, that fixed 1st of June and 1st of October, but to use the first input argument and, oh, the, sorry, the second input argument and the third input argument. Because the first, again, being the uh, script name. Zero. So basically, these lines are the same, but instead of hard coding the state here, we we can select something else. Take it here, and this is basic. This is exactly what we'll type on the command line. Yep. Okay. And then now and the output file name. I guess that's at the yes. bottom here. Exactly. Mm. And you can either capture that in the beginning or in the end. I personally um, keep parsing arguments in one place and using them later on, but okay. that's personal style. Yeah, well, mm. OK. The, the, this what you're doing do here is way. perfectly fine. Yeah, so here we capture this argument, which is a string, always in argv. We stored an output name and we save it to that output name. Yep. Okay, so I will file and save. And we try running. So I go yep. back to the terminal. Mm, are these things, maybe I'll paste these into the hackmd exactly as they are, just to. Well, the second one, the first one's in the other script or in the lesson material. OK, that's there. So going to the command line. So we did Python weather observations. Mm -hmm. So the first argument is a date, 01, 03, 2021. And that's sys.argv1. Yep. So the convention in Unix is the argv0 is always the name of the thing that's running, in this case, weather observations. This is argv1, and then one spring in Tapiola. And this is argv3, which is the output file name. Not.py.png. Oh, PNG. <laughs> OK. Should we run? That should work. OK. If you, if you ls, you should have a spring and tapiola PNG, hopefully. Yes, spring and tapiola. OK. So now with okay. this, we can make a script, like make some other program that will call this mm, 100 times with different date ranges and areas and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you could, for example, um, make individual plots for all different months um, or for a certain, uh, for, yeah, potentially also every every single day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Depending what's in the data uh, that's useful or not. I think yeah. this data only has like four points per day. Yeah. So per day is maybe not that useful. Yeah. And the reason this is so powerful is that the command line is basically made for automating stuff and running other programs. So every computer cluster, every workflow flow tool that does stuff many times, the universal interface is the command line. Yep. So it's super easy to make a program that will call this program many different times. In fact, in a few weeks, Alto, I believe, is running a course called Linux shell scripting or Linux shell tutorial, where we sort of talk about these kinds of issues. OK, so. Well, the, uh, my, my, my personal biggest issue with um, this kind of uh, sysarg file parse or argv parsing um, is uh, you have no idea what you're actually putting in. 
you 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 now we now know that for this script okay this is date date output file but there's little to no explanation on this at all so if you want to know this you have to really look into the code mm. which is pretty inconvenient right okay mm -hmm. and um any small well I, if if you have if you imagine that you want to have multiple or more arguments, then this becomes completely unreadable, and uh, it's very prone to you putting in a argument at the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So there are um, tools that essentially help you to make this a little bit uh, more convenient. Um, for example, arg parse, doc doc, or click. They are all uh, Python packages that kind of make command parsing um, more robust. And uh, for we'll go a little bit more into details on arc parse, um, which conveniently, when you set up the ind the individual arguments, also provides you with an additional help argument, so that a, a user that doesn't know the script or doesn't know the code, mm. can essentially just say Python uh, command minus, uh, uh, minus minus help oh. and say, OK, how is how is the syntax for this uh, command? I guess oh. these kinds of things here, like somehow yeah. we're defining the arguments and then. Uh, With our parse, this... you are, um, oh, and okay. I think I missed something the here. Lesson's wrong. These are slightly misnamed. Let's look at this one. So it, this is the start argument. And it says the help is start time. I think. Yeah, they are they were misnamed. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and but in the solution, it's correct. If you if you scroll a little bit further down, there's also another mis uh, another mistake that I, uh, that I just noticed because we are not initializing the arg uh, the argument parser initially. Yes. Richard, if you could scroll a f further down a bit, so mm -hmm. that uh, actually to the solution because that. So is it further? Yeah. Do you want to see the, the solution? solution for exercise three? Because um, that uh, at the moment, so a little bit okay. now further up, because I for, uh, somehow in that um, mm. statement, I forgot the to actually initialize the argument parser. And without that, all of the uh, all of these other commands would just uh, raise arrows that parser mm. is not existent. I'm not sure what I should do. <laughs> <laughs> But in the end, should we um, give some? Uh, yeah, what should should we do? Mm, demo here, or should we give exercise time? We have fifteen minutes left. Um, I would I would go a little bit over the uh, how this uh, how this argument parsing uh, works and what kind of things go into the argument parser. Mm -hmm. Um, just to just to explain how that add argument works. Um, so yeah. essentially, the first two arguments, though, uh, for example, that um, uh, on the third line, so the start time, the first mm -hmm. argument is a shorthand, so that you don't have to uh, have um, dash dash start, but can say like this. minus s. Um, okay. Then in this instance, this is a uh, argument that has a default value. So if you don't provide it, it will take the default value. Mm -hmm. You give a type for the argument, which is important because uh, you um, because uh, parse then converts it into a specific format. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in our case that these are all strings. But um, for example, you can give give integer or something else in there as well. I guess so it you would don't give a good to... error message like this is not an integer. This is so... not integer and you don't need to convert it in your code. Mm -hmm. That's also kind of, in my opinion, quite convenient. And then you get a can provide a help string. Mm -hmm. What is this and potentially format of something? Yeah. And uh, on the two lines further up, um, they are fixed arguments. So they are positional arguments, um, input, output, because they always need to be there. Mm -hmm. And they are not optional, so they okay. are not named. You can also um, uh, use uh, 
tax for uh, for fair for non or for for required arguments, but you can as well leave them as these are the first yeah. two arguments that always have to be there. So what you're saying is that the start and end is optional. So we could do Python weather observations. We just input a, yeah, exactly. Not and in then, in your case at the moment because you don't use arc parse yet. But yeah, yeah. So this would be valid, and then yes. start equals o one o one to o one nine. Yeah. So basically, you have good defaults, and then you can modify. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, let's give everyone another. Mm -hmm. Should we give give five everyone another minutes? ten? No, well, uh, in uh, ten yeah, say, in... Let's say to fifty-five, and okay. then I'll talk yeah. a little bit more about one thing I want to mention. Yeah. Okay. We will be back. Can uh, let's update HackMD and see you. And we're back. So, um, yeah, so I will imagine that for many people, this wasn't enough time. That's OK. This was basically just to get some experience starting. You can go and um, explore more yourself. Look at the solutions. Um, and that's perfectly fine. Um, yeah. Like making command line interfaces is something that I think is important, but really um, takes a It takes long more time than you want time. it to take. Yeah. And there is no, unfortunately, like, since you have to define all arguments and everything, it just takes time. Yeah. And it's sort of an art, like, you know, you get better at it over time and you start copying things you've done and so on. Um, should I go do the example live quickly? Uh, well, is it basically yeah. the solution here? That, uh, that's the solution. Um, or should we just discuss? Actually, I think we, can we, uh, we will just discuss and I okay. would like to mention one more thing in the end. Yeah, okay. Um, so what are your so, comments? So uh, as you can see in the well, actually discussion box a little bit further, you can you can now use multiple different input files. You can use uh, start, end dates, and so on. And um, you can actually loop over different input file patterns to say, uh, or different input files to provide data for, diff for different, uh, from different sources. And ArcParse gives you the, this nice help information. So if you give the script to someone else, they can much more easily fit in their um, input data or their requests. Um, but if you look at uh, the potential commands here, partially depending on, uh, partially due to the size of the input data uh, files, they get long, they get really long. So input lines get long and again, in my opinion, more or less unreadable. So for any tool that uh, actually needs a lot of in a lot of input arguments, I personally uh, do prefer to use config files, and mm -hmm. um, actually provide information in config files. Uh, there is a section, uh, another section here about config files that you can read if you uh, if you have time later on, and that can give you some useful information on how to how to build a config file and what uh, config files can do for you. Mm -hmm. It's just something I definitely wanted to mention uh, when producing scripts that too many input arguments, actually, in my opinion, more than three, um, get even with, a, with argument parses inconvenient. Okay. What, what, what's, your, what's your take on that, Richard? How yeah. many input arguments do you think are still, well, sensible? Yeah, well, I mean, I would usually, instead of having a separate configuration file, like I would do that sometimes, but if I'm running it many times, I'd end up having another script 
which prepares the arguments and then calls the script. So basically a program that calls the program that does what might work and that somehow manages the arguments in a sensible way. Um, yeah. Uh, uh but that, that's true for it, there's many I think different it depends on your on ways. your uh, use case if if it's if it's for yeah. a cluster yeah then yeah. you might not care about yeah. the number of input arguments because they are automatically prepared yeah if it's for another user i think mm -hmm. and i guess them a config file is, is easier also the reproducibility of it so when you have the config file then that's saved and you basically have it and then you mm, What's that called? So you have it, and then you'll always know what you ran in the future. Well, if you run the command line, it might be stored in the history, but then it's sort of lost, and you don't know how you generated it. And you don't necessarily know which co which uh, input line arguments led to which result. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, yes, exactly. So we're sort of running out of time here. There's one thing I wanted to highlight from the HackMD. Can you say something about argparse versus click? There's a long discussion of it there. <laughs> so um, in, pra in, in practice, in my opinion, there, there are all, essentially all of the models have their advantages and disadvantages. And in the end, it's up to your personal style. Or if you if you have some feature that ArcPars doesn't have, or that and that Click has, use Click. If you have a feature that ArcPars has and Click doesn't have, use ArcPars. Yeah. Um, they are not in any way, in my opinion, critical which one you choose, um, except if you really need something that only one of them has. And. Mm -hmm. Personally, I always use argparse just because it's fewer dependencies. So, like I, so click is probably, well, almost definitely a much nicer thing. But um, many of my programs, I try to make run with the fewest dependencies as possible, especially if it has no other dependencies. And then I'll do that. So, but. You know, in the end, it's up to you. I would give both a try because they're both nice. Mm, should we head to a break? Sounds sensible. Okay, so we can keep discussing questions about command lines in the HackMD during the break. So coming up after the break will be, I believe, 40 minutes about SciPy and the bigger library ecosystem, and then a break, and then 60 minutes about the parallel programming.